All right. Well, I appreciate Brother Dave and Sister Linda. I appreciate the work they do here with our music, and we have good singing because of it. Uh, I'd like you to take your Bible this morning, turn to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, go to the last verse in that chapter, verse 28, uh, I'm going to preach uh, from Hebrews chapter 9, 28, uh, that's, well, that's why I'm having you turn there, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Uh, uh, anyway, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, here's what the scripture says. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we bow our heads looking for wisdom from you, I ask that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us strength, and Father, that you would help us to learn from your word. Uh, Lord, that you'd give me a message. I have some ideas and I have some things written down. But Father, I pray this morning that you would give your strength to me and that you would give your help to me and that you would help me to preach today that, Father, the things that I say would bring glory and honor to you and that we would be able to say when we leave here that it has been good to be in your house. Open our hearts and minds this morning and help us to understand, I pray in Jesus' name and amen. Uh, a little bit of, uh, some of you weren't here last week, and so I preached from the first part of this verse last week, first part of verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And I talked about that is the gospel. He, uh, I, I spoke that included in bearing the sins of many is uh, what Paul told us in the book of 1 Corinthians. He told us that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. They're all included in what's called the gospel. Um, and so the, the thing of it is, to those who believe that, to those of us who uh, believe that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and he rose from the grave, to those who believe that, we have this hope this promise from our Lord that he's going to come again. Uh, listen, uh, I, I truly believe with all my heart uh, that one day uh, the, the trumpet's going to sound, uh, the eastern sky is going to part, and I'm going to see the face of, uh, of my Lord, and he's going to be coming through the clouds, and he's coming to redeem his church out of this world. Uh, he's coming to uh, give me my eternal home, uh, and it's all a gift because salvation is a gift, and I didn't do anything to earn it. He did it all, and I'm looking forward to that day, folks. I'm looking forward to his return, uh, but I, I want you to understand that we have this hope, and in the meantime, there are some things that we need to be doing. Uh, listen. Uh, one of the things that Jesus said was, uh, didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? And folks, if we are to, to be true children of God, then one of the things we must be is about our father's business. And uh, listen, going to church is a part of that. Praying is a part of that. Uh, warning others is a part of that. Being an example to those outside the church is part of it. I want to be the best example I can be of what a Christian should be. And, and, and I fail. I fall down. I make mistakes. Uh, thank God for His grace. And i got a lot to learn yet. And it doesn't matter how much I learn in this life, I'll never learn it all. Now, Paul himself said, I think myself not to have apprehended. And if I think about the Apostle Paul and what a great servant of God, and if he said, I haven't done it, then I know i got a long way to go. Okay, But I thank God for his grace again, because he is gracious. Now, when I talk about this in his second coming, I, I want to bring some things to mind. And I talk about there's some things we must do. And I mentioned be about our father's business. And when I think about this, let me start this sermon this way. 
Uh, anybody remember John Wooden? John Wooden, the great coach of the uh, UCLA Bruins. He, while he was the coach of the UCLA Bruins, they won 11 NCAA championships. And it's incredible because they did it in a span, I believe, of 18 years. Uh, it's an incredible run. But John Wooden, a lot of people look at him as he, and he was, you know, one of the things that John Wooden said about being a coach, he said a coach is nothing more than a teacher. He teaches people how to act as a team. But John Wooden had godly parents, and John Wooden had a godly character himself. And it was because of his godly parents. And he, he said this when he left home. He said, my father gave me this advice when I left home. He said, drink deeply from good books every day, and especially the Bible. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty good advice. And I wonder today, first of all, how many of us are drinking from the Word of God every day? I hope you are. I hope you pick it up for more than just a few minutes. I hope you pick it up and read a chapter. And you say, well, I don't understand it or I have trouble understanding. Remember, there's a promise to those who read it that God blesses them. And you may not understand it all. And I say this to people. You know, you want to understand it. One of the best things you can do is get a dictionary out. Look up the words. Find out what they mean. And I'm not trying to be so elementary here, but I'm trying to say that it is important that we open God's Word every day. I came across this quote, and I like this. Every day we must seek to obtain a richer and fuller faith and a more complete knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we're not going to do that if we don't get into His Word. I, I always like the quote from Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein said, I want to know God's thoughts. Folks, if you want to know God's thoughts, here they are. God has given us what he thinks. He's told us how we ought to live. But we can't follow it and the direction in it until we read it. I can come and try and preach a, a message to encourage you and to give you direction and such, but you have to take initiative every day. Recently, I came across this quote from a, an American pastor. His name's, name was Phillips Brooks. And he lived in, during the 1800s. And, and during the late 1800s, telescopes were something that were new. But he was familiar with them, and he said this. He said, the Bible is like a telescope. If a man looks through his telescope, then he sees worlds beyond. But if he looks at his telescope, then he does not see anything but a telescope. The Bible is a thing to be looked through. To see that which is beyond. But most people only look at it. And I think that's where we find a lot of modern Christians. We're only looking at the Bible. We're not looking through the Bible. Folks, looking through the Bible enables you to see some things. Uh, listen, uh, I can see, first of all, the creation of the universe looking through the Bible. Uh, I can see the great miracles that God did in both the Old and the New Testaments by looking through the Bible. I can see believers standing in the face of great opposition by looking through the Bible. I can rejoice with the saints of old as they discovered bits of wisdom and truths by looking through the Bible. I can sit with the disciples on a hillside in Galilee and listen to Jesus preach if I look through this Bible. And I can sit at my Lord's feet and I can hear Him promise to me that He will again come, that He will come again and receive me to Himself and there I will be forever with Him if I choose to look through the Bible. 
Our writer says here that Jesus is going to come a second time. If you look through the Bible like it's a telescope, you'll find out something interesting. One of every 30 verses in the New Testament says He's coming again. And over 1,800 times in both the Old and the New Testaments, the second coming is spoken of. I wonder this morning if we are a people who are truly ready for Jesus to come again. I ask that question, and I want it to soak in, and I want you to think about it. Are we a people that are truly ready for Jesus to come again? That's an important question. I want to tell you this. Uh, uh, one of our preachers used to say this. Preacher, when is he coming? And I'm going to talk more about this in a moment, but the answer is this. I don't know when he's going to come, but I'm going to talk more about this. But I know this. If you die today, that's when he came for you. Are we ready? Are we ready? It's important. When is Jesus coming? You know, Peter said there would be scoffers saying, where is the sign of His coming? Things just keep going on like they always have. And they're here today. They keep talking that way. They're here today. Jesus said this, That day and hour knoweth no man, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Listen, folks, I don't know when He's coming. Only the Father knows when He's coming back. That's what Jesus said. And you know what's interesting? Uh, as I was preparing this message, I got to wondering, how many people have predicted a date for Christ's return? You know, every once in a while we hear about them, don't we? You know, there was one last year in 2020 predicting that Jesus was going to come back. He had dates set. Well, last I checked, it's 2021. I found it interesting that just the ones we know of, since the time of Christ ascended into heaven, till this point right now, there have been 44 individuals who predicted a date for Christ's return. Now here's the thing. It's interesting to me that there were 44 of them. Those are just the ones we know of. There are others, I'm sure, that are not caught up in history. But these are historical uh, predictions by people. What's interesting to me is this. There were more predictions that he would come than just 44 predictions. Why is that? Because some of the people had more than one date. Why is that? Because some of the people picked a date and he didn't show up. And they said, okay, I went back and recalculated. And now I know he's coming on this day. And that didn't happen. So they, oh. And you know what's amazing? People still believed them. Jesus said, when they say, oh, he's in the desert, don't listen to him. He's up on the mountain. Don't listen to him. Why? Because only the Father knows the day He's coming. Only the Father. Mark down the man or woman who claimed to know because those are false prophets. Here's the thing that I want you to understand about the second coming. We must be ready at all times. For his coming. First, we must be convinced that he's coming again. When I read the scriptures, I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 2, and I want you to listen to it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 2. For yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. I want, you to, I want you to let those words sink in for a minute. Listen to the, to, to the phrase he uses. For yourselves know perfectly well. Did you hear that? Know perfectly well. You yourselves know perfectly well. 
That is a phrase that is used when you wish to indicate that a person you are speaking to already knows something you have just said or are about to say. <laughs> I was thinking about that. For yourselves know perfectly well. And I believe that's a phrase I heard in regards to my behavior from my mom on a few occasions. You know perfectly well what I'm about to say. And she, I, she did say that a few times. Paul wants us to listen. He says, you know this truth. You already know. I'm writing, you about, I'm writing to you about something that you already know. You know perfectly well. Jesus is coming again. I came across a story about a man and his daughter who were swimming off the coast of New Jersey, and they were swimming in the ocean. And as they swam for a while, the man began to realize that the current was carrying them farther away from shore, and they had got separated, and he could not get to his daughter. So he called to her, and he told her, I'm going to have to swing back to shore, and after I get back to shore, I will come for you. But if you get tired of swimming, turn on your back and float on your back, because you can float all day on your back, and I'll be back. I'll come and get you. He got back to the shore. And when he got back to the shore, he enlisted the help of some other individuals and they got out in some boats. Four hours later, they located her. And you know what she was doing? She was floating on her back, just as her father had told her. And when they picked her up and they brought her back and there were tears and cheers and they rejoiced that she had been saved, that, that her life had been spared. She said, I don't know why you're all so excited. Dad told me I could float on my back and I did and he told me he was going to come and get me and I believed him. Folks, if we could only have the faith of that child when it comes to the second coming, if we could only believe the words of our Savior when he says, I will come again and I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. But in the meantime, follow my directions. Do what I tell you to do. Oh, how different life could be for most of us. I learned a long time ago. I learned if you just obey those who are in authority, when it comes to doing the right thing, things go a lot better. I learned that with my parents. Oh, listen, I've had the Board of Education applied to my seat of learning a few times. I've had that. I've experienced that. And you know what? I've learned from it. But wouldn't it have been better just to follow instructions to begin with? Listen. Listen to the second half of 1 Thessalonians 5.2. For ye yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. A thief in the night. What does that mean? When does a thief show up? A thief shows up when he thinks you're not expecting him. <laughs> Jim, I'm going to tell something you did. My brother used to live in a, uh, an apartment complex in Oildale. Anybody ever been to Oildale? Well, I'll tell you something I learned. It's not the end of the world, but you can see it from there, all right? <laughs> <laughs> My brother used to live in Oildale, and he lived in some apartments, and where the door to the apartment opened to the little walkway, uh, there was a fence on the other side, if I remember correctly, and that walkway was a perfect shortcut for people. And all through the night, people would make their way down. And things would disappear from your property if you had left them out. Well, my brother decided he had a way to stop this. I thought this was pretty, pretty good. And what he did was this. He hooked up a little electric eye so that it's motion sensed. And you know, most of the time, those are connected to a light. 
And when you come by, the light comes on. And the idea is, oh, I shouldn't be here. No, my brother had a better idea. He hooked it to the sprinkler. <laughs> and so in the middle of the night, when somebody came down the walk, and they hit that little electric eye, they made that motion detector, all of a sudden, they would get sprayed with the sprinkler. Well, guess what? It stopped the foot traffic. Why? Because they weren't expecting the water, were they? Folks, we need to live like we're expecting Jesus to come back. So we're not surprised when it happens. Listen, he's going to come as a thief in the night. The song that we sing once in a while, Oh, can we say we are ready? Brother, I like that song, and I just want to hear. I want you to hear the last verse of it. This is, will Jesus find us watching? Blessed are those whom the Lord finds watching. In His glory they shall share. If He shall come at the dawn or the midnight, will He find us watching there? Oh, can we say we are ready, brother? Ready for the soul's bright home. Uh, say, will He find you and me still watching, waiting, waiting? When the Lord shall come. Will he? Will he find you and me ready? Will he find us waiting? Will he find us watching? I hope he is. I hope today that you believe more than anything that Jesus is coming again. Listen, are you ready for his return? When I look at this world, we were talking about this just the other day at work. Some of the, one of the bosses, one of my supervisors and several of us. We were talking about the things we see in our nation we never thought we would have seen even 10 years ago. And I look at my nation and how sin sick we are. And I wonder, how long is Jesus going to tarry? Because folks, I wonder, I'm, I'm, we're handing this world off to our children and our grandchildren. What kind of a world are they going to inherit? Oh, Jesus, we need to pray like John. Even so, Lord Jesus, come again, return. Listen, are we ready for his return? Luke chapter 12 and verse 40. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. When you get all relaxed, when you think <laughs> everything's good, everything's cool, man, I'm not going to be... He's going to show up. Listen. This verse, this Luke chapter 12, verse 40, it has to do with becoming complacent. Um, listen, we can become complacent when we think, Paul said it this way, don't think yourself something that you're not. We can become complacent when we think we've got this all figured out. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I've been at this since I was 18. I've messed up a bunch of times and I've done a lot of things wrong in between. And I haven't figured it all out yet. There's a lot of the scripture that I don't understand yet. Now, I'll tell you this. I know enough that I know what I should be doing and what I shouldn't be doing. And that's what we need to focus on. You know, that's the problem we have with a lot of people. Well, I don't know enough. Folks, if you take the knowledge you have of what you have and you concentrate on that, you'd be surprised at how far you can go in your Christian life. You know, I hadn't planned on saying this, but I'm, I'm going to read this. I haven't planned on this. Let me get over here. Psalm 1. If you don't know any other passage of Scripture, I, I, I'm serious about what I'm about to say, and all you have is Psalm 1, and I encourage each one of you, go home and read it this week. But all you have is Psalm 1, and you looked at it, and you put the principles in Psalm 1 into practice, I'm going to tell you something, folks. You could live a pretty good Christian life. 
Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Who are you listening to? Nor standeth in the way of sinners. Who are you associating with? Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Who's teaching you? But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the, ungod but the way of the ungodly shall perish. If all you have is Psalm 1, and if that's all you can apply, you can live close to God. Complacent. We must be on guard against complacency. Complacency means this. Self-satisfaction, especially when accompanied by unawareness of actual dangers or difficulties. We can become numb. Listen, folks, we've got to be careful of this. We are so bombarded every day by the things of this world. We can become numb, and they can become commonplace, and they ought not to be commonplace for the Christian. Let me give you an example. I've never forgotten this. Some years ago, an old preacher, I, I don't even remember his name, but I remember this. He said this, he said, cussing, cursing has become so common in TV shows. He said, and I'll never forget this, we would not allow people to talk in our homes like we allow the TV to talk at us. I want you to think about that. Think about that. It's become something, well, it's just part of the program. And we just kind of go along. You know, we need to be careful what we take into our mind, what we put into our heart. If Jesus comes... Will he be happy? Will we, will what we read and what we look at and what we listen to be acceptable when he returns? I, I, I recently came across, I thought it was, I thought, I like, there's a, a, a group, I don't know, I hesitate, I don't even know why I'm going to say their name, but they play folk music and they play uh, uh, lack of a better way to put it, hillbilly music. And I like it. It's banjos. It's, it's guitars. It's, it's the bass. It's, I mean, they sound so good. And I was listening to this group, and I thought, hey, these guys are neat. And they sang some old folk songs and some old country songs. And I thought, man, these guys, I like this. And, and as I was listening to one of the songs, I heard... Not just cursing, but I heard the F word. And I thought, that can't be. And I rewound it. So I, and sure enough, and I thought, you know what? I like their music, but I can't take this. So I had to cut them off. Listen, folks, I don't want that stuff in my heart and my mind. We need to be careful what we put into our heart and my, our mind. We need to not become complacent. Um, when, when we say, our, uh, we need to, to ask ourselves, are we ready for his return? Are our hearts right? Are our minds right? It's not just well, the way we act, but it's also the right attitude to go with it. I came across a story about a little girl and she had been listening to her mother and her friends have a discussion about the return of Jesus. and The friends left, and in a little while, the little girl disappeared. And her mom began to wonder, where did she go? And She found her in her room, and she was staring out 
the window of her room. And her mom said, what are you doing? And she said, oh, mama, I was listening to you talk to your friends about Jesus coming again. And I was wondering if he might come today. And so I came in and I washed myself. I took a bath. And I put on a new dress. And now I'm looking out the window because I want to be the first one to see him. Oh, if we could get that in our spiritual lives like that little girl had it. We would be ready for his return. Clean and dressed in the white robes and ready. Jesus, I want you to come. But how many of us would scurry trying to put things away if he showed up? Can I tell you this? I want this to be clear. I don't believe Jesus ever lied to us. Let me say that again. I don't believe Jesus ever lied to us. I heard about a fella who he went to the welfare office to pick up his check. When he got to the office, he came time to get his check. He told the fellow at the counter, he said, you know, he said, I'm tired of this. He said, I'd really rather have a job than get this check. And the fellow said, oh, you're lucky. You're, this is your lucky day, sir. We have a job. It just came open. He said, you do? And he said, yes. He said, in fact, it's for a very wealthy uh, man. Uh, he, uh, wants you, he needs a security, a person for security for his daughter. He provides a brand new Mercedes for you to drive. Uh, there is an apartment that goes along with his job. It's $200,000 a month. And because the well, days are so long, meals are all provided. And there will be some trips to Europe. And the fellow said, that's fantastic. He said, but you have to be lying. And he said, well, you started it. You started it. We are capable of lies. But Jesus never lied. And you know what he said? In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Do you hear that? I like that. If it were not so, I would would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Albert Einstein said, I don't like this quote, only two things are certain in the universe. I put this. I, I messed it up, all right? He, Albert Einstein said this. Only two things are certain. The universe and human stupidity. And I'm not certain about the universe. But I am certain about human stupidity, all right? Now, I am certain of this. Jesus is coming again. He is coming again. And I want to tell you something. I came across this, and I want you to listen to it. We need to be ready. And not all of us are on the same level. And I realize that. Some people know more than others. Some people study more than others. Some people have a better aptitude for understanding things than others. But we can all do our best to learn and grow. And that's what this quote has to do. Listen to this. No two Christians are exactly this, uh, have exactly the same talents and opportunities, of course. But each believer in Christ should come to a as, a as rich and full understanding of the facts about his Savior as he possibly can. No quest can be more rewarding. And I like that. Because it's true. Every one of us have different abilities. But every one of us can apply ourselves the same. And we can all be ready when he returns. I wonder today, are you ready? 
Are you ready for him to come back? Let's all stand to our feet, all heads bowed, all eyes closed, no one looking about. I don't know where you stand with Jesus. I don't know how your heart is today. I don't know how your soul is today. Uh, but I do know this. <clears throat> Jesus is coming again. And he's only going to come and receive those who truly believe. How is your heart and how is your soul? Are, have you fallen down recently? Have you uh, given up recently? Have you uh, uh, missed the boat, so to speak? And you say, I want to get back in the boat and I want to serve him all the way. Oh, listen. He's coming again. He's coming again. How is your heart and soul? attention. Hope this has been good for you. We're going to be dismissed as we are dismissed this morning. Um, Sister Wanda, would you lead us in prayer? Dear Father, as we come to the end of this worship service, we thank you for the word that has been preached to us. And for Brother John, as he studies and then as he imparts to us things we need to hear, things we need to be reminded of. We thank you for each one that has gathered this morning to worship. We pray that you would bless each home. Thankful for those that have been gone, had safe trips. Have joined us again. Bless each one of our homes. Help us to live holy lives before a lost world. Continue to heal those that are brokenhearted. Touch bodies that are in pain. And give comfort to those that care for others. Be with our loved ones wherever they are. That they will see reality in our yes. lives yes, Lord. from serving you. May we draw closer to you. That's been preached to us this morning. We again ask that you bless the word as it went forth. Give a safe journey to our homes. And we thank you for these blessings. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.